and I knew what it took. So I know when my opponent is asleep, I'm out there at four or five in the morning, chopping trees, working to this day. Because I can retire today. I'm well off, very comfortable. But I got the will to win. Take yourself out your comfort zone. Do not live in your bubble. Put some more air in your bubble. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. You will fail in your comfort zone. Success is not a comfortable procedure. What if we have that kind of attitude? The cars repossess. Nobody believes in you. You've lost again and again and again. The lights are cut off, but you're still looking at your dream, reviewing it every day and say to yourself, it's not over until I win. The heaviest things in life aren't iron and gold, but unmade decisions. The reason you are stressed is that you have decisions to make and you're not making them. Embrace the process. And then by the time you get up in years, you can be a man that you're proud of. Okay? So this is just an encouragement to just chill out. Just chill out. Embrace the process. You say, Dwayne, what process? Life. Be the guy who embraces the ugly, the miserable. Uh, be the guy who embraces hard work, the grind. Don't be afraid of being hurt. Don't be afraid of sacrificing some blood. You cannot change your life unless you change something. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. He believed in himself, and you can too. You can do anything that... It's your reaction to adversity, not adversity itself, that determines how your life story will develop. You'll see the most clearly at your life's darkest moments. Difficulties strengthen the mind as labor does the body. Seneca. Fear is temporary. Regret is forever. Have patience and trust the process. The harder you work, the luckier you will get. If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Zig Ziglar. About purity. Some persons raise a question whether the social feeling is contained in the nature of man. And yet I think that these same persons would have no doubt that love of purity is certainly contained in it. And that if man is distinguished from other animals by anything, he is distinguished by this. When, then, we see any other animal cleaning itself, we are accustomed to speak of the act with surprise and to add that the animal is acting like a man. And on the other hand, if a man blames an animal for being dirty, straightway as if we were making an excuse for it, we say that of course the animal is not a human creature. So we suppose that there is something superior in man and that we first receive it from the gods. For since the gods by their nature are pure and free from corruption, so far as men approach them by reason, so far do they cling to purity and to a love of purity. But since it is impossible that man's nature can be altogether pure being mixed of such materials, reason is applied as far as it is possible, and reason endeavors to make human nature love. The first, then, and highest purity is that which is in the soul, and we say the same of impurity. Now you could not discover the impurity of the soul as you could discover that of the body, but as to the soul, what else could you find in it than that which makes it filthy in respect to the acts which are her own? Now the acts of the soul are movement toward an object or movement from it, desire, aversion, preparation, design, assent, what then is it which in these acts makes the soul filthy and impure? Nothing else than her own bad judgments. 
Consequently, the impurity of the soul is the soul's bad opinions, and the purification of the soul is the planting in it of proper opinions, and the soul is pure which has proper opinions. For the soul alone in her own acts is free from perturbation and pollution. Now we ought to work at something like this in the body also as far as we can. It was impossible for the defluxions of the nose not to run when man has such a mixture in his body. For this reason nature has made hands and the nostrils themselves as channels for carrying off the humors. If then a man sucks up the defluxions, I say that he is not doing the act of a man. It was impossible for a man's feet not to be made muddy and not be soiled at all when he passes through dirty places. For this reason, nature has made water and hands. It was impossible that some impurity should not remain in the teeth from eating. For this reason, she says, wash the teeth. Why? In order that you may be a man and not a wild beast or a hog. It was impossible that from the sweat and the pressing of the clothes there should not remain some impurity about the body which requires to be cleaned away. For this reason, water oil, hands, towels, scrapers, nitre, sometimes all other kinds of means are necessary for cleaning the body. You do not act so, but the smith will take off the rust from the iron and we will have tools prepared for this purpose. And you yourself wash the platter when you are going to eat, if you are not completely impure and dirty. But will you not wash the body nor make it clean? Why? He replies, I will tell you again, in the first place, that you may do the acts of a man, then that you may not be disagreeable to those with whom you associate. You do something of this kind even in this matter, and you do not perceive it. You think that you deserve to stink. Let it be so. Deserve to stink. Do you think that also those who sit by you those who recline at table with you, that those who kiss you deserve the same? Either go into a desert where you deserve to go, or live by yourself and smell yourself. For it is just that you alone should enjoy your own impurity. But when you are in a city, to behave so inconsiderately and foolishly, to what character do you think that it belongs? If nature had entrusted to you a horse, would you have overlooked and neglected him? and now think that you have been entrusted with your own body as with a horse. Wash it, wipe it, take care that no man turns away from it, that no one gets out of the way for it. But who does not get out of the way of a dirty man, of a stinking man, of a man whose skin is foul, more than he does out of the way of a man who is daubed with muck? That smell is from without, it is put upon him. But the other smell is from want of care, from within, and in a manner from a body in putrefaction. But Socrates washed himself seldom. Yes, but his body was clean and fair, and it was so agreeable and sweet that Tyle most beautiful and the most noble loved him, and desired to sit by him rather than by the side of those who had the handsomest forms. It was in his power neither to use the bath nor to wash himself if he chose, and yet the rare use of water had an effect. If you do not choose to wash with warm water, wash with cold. But Aristophanes says, Those who are pale, unshod, tis those I mean. For Aristophanes says of Socrates that he also walked the air and stole clothes from the palaestra. But all who have written about Socrates bear exactly the contrary evidence in his favor. They say that he was pleasant not only to hear, but also to see. On the other hand, they write the same about Diogenes. For we ought not even by the appearance of the body to deter the multitude from philosophy. But as in other things, a philosopher should show himself cheerful and tranquil, so also he should in the things that relate to the body. See ye men, that I have nothing, that I want nothing. See how I am without a house, and without a city, and an exile, if it happens to be so. And without a hearth I live more free from trouble, 
and more happily than all.